Hey guests, friends, um, my name is Valentina Ismailova and I'm the director of the Karaman Institute. I have the pleasure of welcoming you all uh, to uh, the closing event of our wonderful exhibition, which we are so grateful for. It provided color, wit, and good humor through some really difficult times um, this spring. Um, our um, relationship uh, with the, the, uh, the Russian American Cultural Center dates back to 2005 yeah. when my predecessor, Catherine Iponishi, first uh, inaugurated our atrium space uh, for cultural events and exhibitions, and it opened up with an exhibition Nabokov. about Nabokov in Montreal, um, which was curated by uh, Regina Erikel. And uh, since then, uh, the relationship between our two institutions has flourished, uh, has brought a lot of um, interesting, inspiring um, exhibitions and events. And we are profoundly grateful that we can again collaborate to celebrate our 75th anniversary and to showcase the work of Mikhail Mugadil. So I will give you Regina, uh, who will talk about the exhibition um, a little bit uh, before we have the two Michaels um, talk about the art itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I have collaborated with Harriman for uh, a little bit less than 20 years. And I think that um, I'm looking to further collaboration and thanks to Valentina, with whom we have had such a great conversation. It would be even better. I hope so. And also, I want to thank Ala Rajkov and the members of Hariman for their help. Always very helpful, uh, very kind, and this is what makes this place very special for all of us. Uh, I'm actually very glad that once I answered your call and came to see your works in your studio, I don't know where it was. It was like a few hours from, the, from my home. Doesn't matter, but when I saw the array of works, I was really impressed by the quality, by the skills, and by the subject matter. And the fact that uh, this exhibition and many of his works dedicated to his childhood memories, uh, memories of uh, the all share our generation. We all remember this fear of living in totalitarian society. Uh, we unfortunately were for the last years, now, have, uh, thankfully for the last years of Stalin's rule, but it was very cruel. Cool. And we all remember the suffering of our families and our parents. Um, I, just I will say, I tell you a few words about the biography. And maybe we will go back a little bit about the exhibition. So, uh, Mikhail uh, Magaril uh, was, was born in the USSR, of course, in Leningrad in 1950. Uh, and he immigrated here to the United States in 1990. Since then, he lived in New York. He graduated from Moscow Polygraphic Institute, which was a former food Mars. A very important uh, art avant-garde art school, uh, and um, he has served in the Russian army. This was the uh, something. This is why Russians survived, by the way. Thank you, my God. in Leningrad, he worked as the State Museum of Ethnography of the People of the USSR. It's a great museum, actually. Uh, next to the Russian Museum of the Center of St. Petersburg, uh, and also for Lenny's Dad and Gatsby Media Publishing Companies. 
Um, on also served as active member of the Leningrad City Committee of Parties before immigrating to the United States. I actually remember this committee. I also was there. It was like you know, years before you know, the Leningrad destroyed the land. The authority wanted the intelligence and you know, take them under control, but at the same time, give them some, you know, air to breathe. In the USA, he has worked to the New York Center for Book Arts for the New York Times as a freelancer. Uh, illustrator. So yeah. And he founded his own his own publishing company, Summer Garden Editions. Uh, Magarin held a number of solo exhibitions of his books, paintings, and sculptures. Uh, received awards uh, for his illustrations, book design, and exhibitions that he organized. He uh, has published more than 20 handmade artist books. Two of them, Nikolai Gogol's <coughs> The Diary of Madman and Oscar Wilde's The Heavy Prince, Designed in 98 and 2000, received the prestigious uh, Karl Herzog Award for Excellence in Book. The artist works are in various American and international collections, including the Metropolitan Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum, London Library of Congress here in the USA. Hermitage, Russian National Library, the Water Library of the Human Imagination, who just showed me something special, uh, as well as in the collections of the universities such as Princeton, Yale, Cornell, and Harvard. Uh, artist Yuri in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, it's a different place than I was. No, the same place. The I just, yes, yes. Oh my God. It's part of. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, is open to people who are interested in art. So everybody is welcome. Welcome <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Mr. Michael's studio. So you already saw the exhibition, and I hope uh, you know you like it. You were interested in this uh, show. Uh, I think, um, in addition to academic training. Um, uh, Mikhail received a um, tradition directly from the member of the Malevich group of his own aunt, Virginia Magalil, who was a, a woman a member of the Ingolis uh, in Vitebsk. So she is also from Vitebsk, and I believe that part of the family also came from Vitebsk, from Belarus. And this is what you're talking about, the Russian avant-garde, <laughs> different sources. And uh, in the United States, of course, another source of his art uh, was taken from pop art, because uh, pop art, uh, what I find out, also was very much influenced by uh, uh, suprematism as a minimalist uh, direction. And also, uh, <coughs> pop artists, uh, they uh, didn't cancel the objective world, but they uh, reversed the meaning of this world, they reversed the meaning of the subjects. And this is exactly the principle that um, uh, Mikhail is using, reversing the meaning of subject he's talking about, he's working with. Uh, and in this case, in, in pop art case, it's a consumerism, for example, and the case, uh, case is a propaganda material because the Soviet Union, uh, the only thing that produced, you know, abandoned it was a propaganda. Uh, and uh, thanks to this, we have this beautiful, playful, witty, uh, humorous images about very difficult uh, subjects, uh, very difficult political subjects. 
we are laughing on uh, tyrants, we are laughing on, uh, uh, you know, uh, very bad experiences of our childhood. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the way how artists overcoming this uh, childhood uh, mm -hmm. trauma and childhood fears. And uh, I think that uh, today, now, uh, two Michaels, one is Michael, one is Mikhail, uh, will continue you know, this conversation about work of uh, Mikhail um, uh, Magalil, and we are all ready to listen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you for coming. And uh, I would like to introduce my friend with whom I'm working for a long time. Michael is a specialist for a rare book, Eastern West European rare book, also working on paper, photography, and also he's a great traveler. We travel two times to Russia and still alive. You know, the last time, it was a time when uh, Khodorkovsky was arrested. We are witness of that. And Michael helped me a lot to have a journey through this American art jungle. He is my guide for this. He has an excellent education and taste and, and completely count on his taste and knowledge. We discuss uh, each my project. And this is very important to have someone smart, good educated with whom you can share the value. And also Michael brought me to Chicago to show me this exciting, amazing, most European city in America. And introduced me to a collection of Best Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, where I got a lot of inspiration. And today, because I'm an artist, I'm not so good in, uh, you know, in the speeches, but Michael will help me and he knows a lot of details which we discuss with him. And this is your turn, Michael, please. <laughs> okay, well, that's very kind of you. And I would like to thank the foundation for inviting me. Uh, and also the Harriman Center. My history with the Harriman Center goes back long before yours because um, <coughs> probably 35 years ago, I audited a course with Professor uh, Ivan Sanders on uh, childhood in the literature of Central and Eastern Europe. And it was one of the finest courses I ever took in my life. And I did not, of course, then know that I would ever be a panelist to discuss two books which are also uh, centered on the experience of children. So uh, that's one coincidence of which there are many that I will touch on in my talk. I'm a little bit self-conscious about this as I told Michael already on Mikhail because uh, most of you probably know more about the things I'm going to be talking about but uh, I'll talk anyway. So we're going to talk about two books to begin with and the first of these uh, is the lullaby or Sheer Eres, which was written by Shaul Shemichowski. Um, Shaul Shemichowski, one of the greatest Hebrew language poets of the 20th century. Uh, now, uh, Shemichowski was born in 1875 uh, in Mikhailov, which is now Mikhailiv, and which now unfortunately is occupied by Mr. Putin's army. Um, but then at the age of 14, he went on to Odessa, where he completed his uh, education before getting a, a medical degree abroad. So uh, Odessa, nearby Odessa, had a long and unfortunate history of pogroms, uh, starting uh, early in the 19th century, in 1825, and then uh, on through the century. One pogrom was just uh, four years uh, after, you know, six years after the birth of, of Tchernikovsky, so he would have been conscious of this. Uh, and then there was a crescendo in 1905 uh, with the Odessa massacre. So uh, I mention this because the lullaby 
uh, which sounds like a, a very anodyne, uh, even sentimental title, is actually a, a very fearsome poem. And uh, the reason for this is that it was composed in 1917. And if the massacre of Odessa in 1905 was uh, terrible, uh, so was the experience of Jews uh, during the First World War. Because as the front moved back and forth through Galicia and Belarus, uh, so did the fortunes of the Jews get worse and worse. And all of this is very compellingly uh, chronicled by, uh, by Ansky, uh, the anarchist, playwright, and ethnographer. And uh, this book and this poem, uh, the other book, it's, it's much more clear because it's, it's the world through the eyes of a child, and that child is sitting to my left. The lullaby, of course, is composed by a parent, but it is a lullaby which triggered the memories of Mikhail and made him anxious to create this, this book. Uh, the way that it came about is that uh, in addition to his qualities as a painter and a book artist, he's also a very fine restorer. And he was restoring a book with a cover by Lizitsky. And the book was Navreka Vavilonsky, uh, by the rivers of Babylon or al Narod Babel in Hebrew. And it was an anthology of poetry on Jewish themes. And he says, and I have no choice but to believe him, that it, it, the, the book fell open to this poem. He was then in contact with a former Judaica librarian at Yale University. And he asked her if she, was a, if she knew the poem. She asked, and she said that she did. And he said, is there a translation? Because it was his intention to illustrate a book with this poem uh, for the simple reason that it awakened all of these memories that he had. And she said there was no translation that she knew of. And she said, well, I happen to have a friend. And that friend was Shulamit uh, Chernoff. And she was, I think, 94 at the time, that she was a poet. And uh, another coincidence is that she got her master's at Columbia University in early childhood education. But she was also a poet. And so she apparently made the first English translation of this poem. Uh, but the other coincidence, which is rather remarkable, is that she was a relative of Shaul Chernikovsky. And there, in fact, exists a photograph of her sitting on the poet's knee. So there was the first English translation. Uh, and it was what it triggered in Michal were these memories that were not so pleasant. And Nanette, when she read this poem, she said, you know, this is a very fierce lullaby. And her, uh, her conclusion was that if it indeed was written by a parent, it was most likely by a father, not a mother. Now, of course, we know that there are many fearsome mothers, and some of them may even be here, right? Uh, but it's true, because this was born out of the pain uh, and the anger uh, of what was being done to the Jewish community during the First World War, of a history of pogroms. And it is a, a, an abashedly Zionist poem, and it expresses the, the fervent wish that at some point, the, the banner of, of the Jews will be raised. Now, this is another coincidence. So it so happens that Michal brought two artifacts with him when he emigrated here, among other things, I'm sure. And both of them went into the creation of this book. The first one was a figurine, which was made in, in the Soviet Union, of a bear. And it wasn't, you know, the ferocious Russian bear that we see in action now in Ukraine. It was this bear. So uh, he reproduced the bear, and he made this as the cover of his book. Because among his other qualities as an artist, he has a knack of creating uh, structures of books that are original and that are the equivalent of what the French call a rayure parlante, which is a binding in which the binding actually reflects the content of the object. So it's a lullaby, so what better than a pillowcase? And this is the pillowcase with this artifact that he brought. And apologetically, he told me the other day that I brought this little figurine from Russia because I'm a bit sentimental, he said. So he is sentimental. But that wasn't the major uh, 
the major. He doesn't think I know how to handle books, but no, no. <laughs> uh, so that was one part of this. Uh, I was going to mention, but I don't have to give you a, a, a lecture in, in Russian history, that the anti-Semitism in the Imperial Russian Army during the First World War was extraordinary. Uh, and uh, this because the chief of staff was Nikolai Yanushkevich, who was a noted anti-Semite. And uh, the expulsions, expropriations, and even military pogroms, the, the murders and the rapes, are, it's just incredible to contemplate. And so the fierceness of the poem is entirely understandable. But when Mikhail was a young child, he had this uh, tapestry which he brought with him. And uh, when he read this poem, this is what it brought to mind. Because the tapestry, which you'll see, is the other way around. Yes. No, this is his face. No, this is the back. It no. works both ways. Yes. This is a, a scene of the Levant. There are Bedouin camels, palm trees. And for him, as a little boy, this was Palestine. Or this was a place where he would be safe because he did not feel safe. And there was every reason for that. Um, his father had been a victim. Thankfully, his father survived, but he had been arrested during the purges in 37 and 38. Uh, he had spent some time in prison. It marked him for the rest of his life because of the uh, uh, sleep deprivation uh, and the fact that he was uh, confined under a glaring light for two months. Afterwards, he could never sleep unless all the light was shut out of the room. So the family was familiar with this, but in the post-war period, um, the last years of Stalin, uh, there was an intense increase in, in anti-Semitism, which is something that is also interesting to, to discuss. But uh, that will play into the discussion of the second book, The Doctor's Plot. When he made this, he decided he would illustrate it to show the need for this Palestine, this you know, idealized vision of Palestine the need for a place to escape because the environment was extremely hostile. And so he created a book with photographs of Leningrad. It's like a family album. It, his, his version yeah. of the family album. So the family album has pictures of the family, but it also has pictures of the Soviet workers' paradise, the communal apartment. It has pictures of the anti-Semitic graffiti. And it really is an account, here we have, yes, death to Jews. This is what he grew up with. And as he says, I think in the book, uh, Jew was kind of a, uh, a dirty word that you did not mention. It was the equivalent of syphilis. Now, uh, it's worth just reflecting a bit about why that was the case, because Stalin, as you probably know, was initially the commissar of nationalities. This because in 1913, he had published in Vienna his On the Question of Nationality. And some people, uh, believe that uh, it actually was Lenin who dictated the text and Bukharin who edited it. But regardless, the important, me the important message this book was that he believed at that time in self-determination. That is to say, he believed that all the nationalities of, uh, of Russia should be able to have their own separate culture, excluding religion, of course, but their separate culture, their separate customs. And uh, that was the basis on which he, uh, he saw the future for Russia. Of course, they would all subordinate that to the larger project of, of socialism. But nevertheless, self-determination was the order of the day. That is until much later, until the 30s. Uh, from 28 to 32 was what Yuri Slavsky called the golden age of diversity in Russia. And this particularly affected for example, the production of children's books, where Soviet children were drowned in books about every nationality, how they dressed, how they looked, what they ate. And then things changed. They changed radically. Um, and uh, what happened was, with time, Stalin thought this idea of self-determination is dangerous. 
it can lead to separatism, and it was better to have uh, centralized power. And then, of course, came the great, the great Patriotic War. Now, the Great Patriotic War was what legitimized the hegemony of the Soviet Union in Central and Eastern Europe. This hegemony was only fair because, after all, it had been the Soviet Union that had defeated fascism in the name of communism. So even those countries who had not been part of the Axis Alliance of Poland, Czechoslovakia, they too suddenly were under the Soviet umbrella. Those people too lost their self-determination and uh, that was the new status quo. But there was another element to this. And this element uh, became clear to me when I was a boy uh, and I was 12 years old and I was in Prague for the first time and I went to see a permanent exhibition uh, in one of the buildings of the Jewish Museum. And even though it was the Jewish Museum, when I saw the exhibition, which consisted of drawings, drawings by children who'd been sent to Theresienstadt and who afterwards were deported and murdered in Auschwitz. And I saw these drawings and they were beautiful and it was a tribute to their teacher. And the word Jew did not appear anywhere. Not Jew, not Jewish, nothing. The, the words that were used in the text were that this was an example of German or Nazi racialist politics, which if you analyze it is really a way of adopting uh, Nazi ideology, because the, this is a race yeah, that's being targeted. These are not people, these are not children, these are not Jews, this is a race. Now, this became a real problem because anything that could distract from, it wasn't a myth, certainly, the Great Patriotic War, and, and no one can diminish the sacrifices of the Russian people, but still, uh, the importance of the Holocaust was something that was a diversion, that was a distraction, and that should not be exaggerated. And this led to some terrible consequences. During the war, uh, Stalin was only too happy when Mikhoils, Solomon Mikhoils, and the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee would raise money for Russia. And they came to New York, and Mikhoils, as most people know, was a good friend of Paul Robeson, and he met Fiorello LaGuardia, and he met Charlie Chaplin, and he raised $16 million. And when he got back to Russia, it became more of a problem because people were talking too much about the Holocaust and this was not on message. And there was another problem that emerged and that problem was his, he had misconstrued uh, the foundation of the state of Israel. Russia was absolutely key and the establishment of the state of Israel, one of the first, if not the first nation to recognize Israel. Now, why did this happen? It happened because uh, he was a bit stuck in the past and his concern was to undermine the position of the United Kingdom in the Middle East. And he assumed that Israel would be almost a communist satellite because of the people's movement, because of socialism. It didn't work out that way. And when they drew closer to America, he was furious. And just as uh, Nikolai Yanushkevich, suddenly he thought, we must do something about these Jews. Now, uh, Mikhoils had the order of Lenin for his performance of uh, King Lear. Mikhoils was uh, a superstar. So he couldn't quite murder him. He, he simply had him murdered and had it dressed up like an automobile accident. Then he arrested most of the members of the uh, anti-fascist committee. And then uh, two years later was the night of the murdered poets and he had some of the most outstanding Yiddish poets in the Soviet Union murdered. And then came the doctor's plot. And so we come to the second book. So the doctor's plot, it, it's much clearer. It's the point of view of a child. And this child is two years old in the fateful year of 1952. And uh, the plans of the plans of Stalin were, were quite well developed. He had already uh, created camps which were going to be used for the expulsion of Jews who would be transported to the eastern parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, there were six or there were nine doctors arrested 
it was maintained and blasted through all the media that there was a Jewish plot to poison the uh, upper echelon of communist leadership in the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, Mikhail didn't know this because he was two years old. So what he knew and what is depicted in this book is the experience of a two-year-old boy. Three years old. No. Three. Oh, sorry. I didn't. Uh -huh. I want to make you feel young. <laughs> so so uh, uh, the story begins with shoelaces. If I wanted to, I would say that it's the shoelaces that tie the whole story together. But these shoelaces, the drawings of the shoelaces meander from page to page to page because Mikhail loved his father and he didn't often have the opportunity of spending time with him and his father offered to take him on an excursion and he wanted very much to go but his father was in a big hurry and he couldn't tie his shoes and so the big drama at first was tying his shoes but he was bound and determined that he would accompany his father because it was a very rare occurrence and it had to, it had to happen so he did and he was taken to an apartment. And the apartment was a woman he didn't know. And that woman, eventually, you, you understand, was a potential victim or a relative of a victim in the doctor's plot. And she turned to his father because his father had had experience of Stalinist repression and might be someone of help and might give useful advice. But Mikhail, the two-year-old, was uh, a little bit impatient because they begin speaking in a strange language. And the language is Yiddish, which he did not know. And then something even stranger happens, something that he says in the book as a child, he felt his mother would never put up with. The woman tears a piece of wallpaper off the wall so that his father can write his phone number and then she licks that piece of wallpaper and sticks it back on the wall, which, of course, even the little boy finds disgusting and says, my mother would never talk with this. Um, and then they leave. And this is surrounded by, and the structure of the book is that uh, you can see the wallpaper that is used, because the wallpaper is a theme which I'll return to shortly. Uh, and there are extracts from real period newspapers, which are blasting the details of this uh, anti-Semitic plot. Uh, not only that, but uh, the whole structure of the book, as you can see, this is also from period uh, newspapers. And uh, there is another, there is another aspect to this. It's a scroll. And when I say the wallpaper is of interest, almost all of Mikhail's books have some sly reference to his family origins in Vitebsk and to the Russian avant-garde. Because uh, uh, Kaminsky, the Bourlux, a Trap for Judges 1 and 2, those two anthologies, they all incorporated wallpaper. Now, uh, so this is his wallpaper. And the way he got the wallpaper is very odd. He got the wallpaper uh, from a meeting. He looked for someone who dealt in wallpaper and he looked for the oldest person he could so he could get period wallpaper. And he found someone in the Chelsea Hotel. And he went to meet the woman in the Chelsea Hotel and he bought this wallpaper and he made a scroll. So uh, he told me the other day, I humored him because I don't think there's any connection that Jack Kerouac had written uh, on the road in the Chelsea Hotel, but was fed up with changing the papers in the typewriter. And so he glued them together and created a kind of scroll and wrote it in 31 days. That to me is not an appropriate reference. The reference is really uh, the Jewish tradition of scrolls. In the, in the portion of the Bible they're called Kitulim or writings, there are five scrolls. There's the book of Esther, uh, there is Lamentations, there's Ecclesiastes, there's the Song of Songs, uh, and there is, what's the one I'm missing? Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, 
Uh, no, uh, the Book of Esther. Yes. The book of, so the Book of Esther. Now the Book of Esther, if you think about it, is about saving the Jews from possible uh, extinction. And uh, this is a scroll too, so it references the Jewish tradition. But here, there's no Esther and there's no Mordecai, and in the end, the hero of this uh, was the angel of death, who 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 got rid of Sarah uh, before he could put into into action his plan, which was already very very far along. But uh, it, it's always interesting to me because Michal always does reference avant-garde things, even in a very indirect way. And there was another book that he did that I like particularly about Mr. Machno, which is very timely because it takes place in Ukraine. And Machno, of course, is a legendary anarchist. And that book, Yablochka, which is the black version of the song, the Russian folk song that was popular during the, the, the Civil War, that is created with uh, stencils, color stencils, exactly the way that Rosta Fenster uh, uh, propaganda sheets were created. So there's always this kind of arrière-pensée in his work where he's very much delivering a message, but he's also acknowledging where he comes from. And that's very true with, these, with both of these books. Uh, the larger point, which when we get to the paintings we, we can discuss, is a common experience, not only of children, not only of artists, but the general experience of people uh, under Stalin, and in fact, throughout the history of the Soviet Union, uh, is this immense cognitive dissonance. Because there's this amazing rhetoric, this amazing propaganda, and it's so, it is so greatly at odds with the reality. And yet, people have to embrace both of these things. And as Mikhail told me, he said, yes, yes, uh, it makes people neurotic, especially artists, but it also makes them creative. And, and that is what is behind these, these uh, paintings, because the paintings embody this cognitive dissonance, because these are horrible things being shown. Young children being taught how to wear gas masks and protect themselves against chemical weapons. Uh, young pioneers learning how to fire uh, machine guns. All of these things which are, you know, there's this wonderful sunny horizon there, these beautiful colors, and yet the message there is very, very sinister. And the paintings convey that he's onto this, you know. And that's why they are funny in the words that come out very frequently as they did today. Funny, witty, uh, uh, extremely ironic, deeply satirical, but also very beautiful. And so they managed to get that, that message across. So uh, that's all I have to say. And, but I'm sure Michal has something to add. Okay, first of all, I would like to show the structure of this. Okay, it goes this way. By the way, on a star, this is a piece from the real newspaper, from that article, from the te terrible article, you know. Uh, spy on the mask of the medical professors. Spy and killers. This was a published in a newspaper Pravda. Okay, when you take it out, this is a scroll. And because it's a major problem with the shoelace, this is how the real shoelace is working. You untie it, and then you will see the long, long scroll. It's, it's longer than this room, actually. And I made it in a technical collage. I cutting, I don't know how to show it, you know, we can, we can stand it vertical, but no, okay. But no, no, you can, you can, you know, this is how, this is actually a real newspaper. And you know, as a small kid, what kids usually doing? They cutting shape from the newspaper. And how this is how the story began. And it's it's a big story. And 
I figured it out a lot of uh, wallpaper. First of all, uh, this is exactly the time, the 50s, when this new uh, wallpaper was produced. And it's a lot of different. I didn't, I, I didn't realize it. First of all, this side, the inner side, very often uh, covered with a glue. This is I cannot use. And also, I tried to find a more or less archival newspaper, uh, wallpaper. This is what we find too. Okay, and this is how the story goes. This is the name of my publishing, and this, this is like a, a title, the first part. And then all I decide because a major problem was a shoelace. I decide to make all drawings using like a shape of the shoelace. And this is how it goes. This is not, I, uh, I need to warn you, this is not a so long as correct, you know, that, that work on, on a road. The no, on a road was 36 meters. Can you imagine? This is not so long. should point out the, the font with the Hebrew style letters. Ah, oh, okay, I'll show you, but it's it's closer to the end you know, this is just how we approach the place where this is the name of the, how you know the people coming across the uh, leningrad and the, the beautiful weather and we uh, you know i was in a good mood by the way and then we approach the strange lobby with the smell of the cats Now we press the ring. Okay. Then what I surprised, it was an absolutely messy room. Everything was upside down. I never seen something like this. And then like this one, all clothes, books, documents, we're in a big mess. And then my father uh, asked the woman, I, I don't know, but I will try to uh, refresh my um, connections and try to help you to try to figure out what happened with your husband. Please put our telephone number in your book. And she replied, I still remember it. We don't have any telephone book. The KGB took all of that book. And this is what happened. By the she used a wallpaper. Okay, this is uh, their conversation. I imitated it Yiddish uh, typography because it's why I didn't understand the, the language that time. And this is how my father, how they speak, and I just listened through the door. And then she came to the wallpaper, to the wall, and rip it like this one. And my father wrote our telephone number. I still remember this. I put it a real number. In Leningrad it was uh, uh, 67 years ago. I still remember it. <laughs> yes. Go, 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 go. And this is the end. Amazing. It's awful. Grown ups should not uh, be held like this because for kids it was something, you know, very strange. It's actually mm, not one of a kind, it's edition. We have, uh, I, I made it five books like this. Okay, that's it. It's copy number four.
terms of the structure, you should say with the star and the box, it's uh, related to the toy you see in the other room because uh, that also is a nod to avant-garde design and all of the, the floats, the tribunes that were created to celebrate Soviet holidays on a much larger scale are uh, kind of referenced with this kind of a, a, a box with a red star and with a picture. Uh, so that also is a little bit of intense. And I, will, I need to say, I was very proud. You know, in the Yale University, they celebrated 100 years of Russian Revolution. People actually mostly forget about this. Mm -hmm. But it was a very small but very good show. All Russian avant-garde artists who work in the book field was a presentative. And I was just one alive person who showed my books. Okay, this is a story about uh, Dr. Splot, but, oh no, the, the, you need to mention about uh, Wolfsy. Oh, yes. We have I'm someone. So sorry, yes, yes, yes. So, so tell me, Wolfsy is, Wolfsy is here, and uh, uh, she is the daughter of one of the doctors who was arrested, and not just a doctor, was one of the most beloved doctors in the Soviet Union at the time because of his great compassion and um, because he treated all people alike. And uh, not only that, but he could have had a very different sort of career because he was the chosen doctor of all of these great celebrities of, of Rostropovich, uh, of uh, Ulanova, of Svetislav Richter. Uh, but uh, he cared about all of his patients. And uh, this very beloved doctor was arrested for an imprisonment. His hospital was closed. And what another coincidence and an unhappy one is that uh, I was unaware, I knew a bit about the Hoyles, another victim. Uh, fortunately, the doctors were released after six months. And I believe that the hospital was reopened of Dr. Bosi. But because was not that lucky. He was brutally murdered in 1948. And his, um, his real name was Vopsi. So this is really kind of a Vopsi presentation. Uh, quite sad, but uh, that's, that's the case. Yes, I'm sorry. And also I need to mention that Tammy Vopsi, she's a very interesting, a very good book artist. We're from the same field and we meet each other at the Center for Book Arts. You know how small our world, how we connect it with invisible threads. It's amazing. Shoelaces. Shoelaces, yes. <laughs> okay, maybe we can... Why don't you take some questions, Michal? Oh, sure, I will be questions. happy. Any questions? <laughs> You know, it depends what kind of book, so, but it takes a lot of time, by the way. It's labor of love, and sometimes it, it takes several years. You know, first of all, you need to approach to concept. Then you begin to thinking how to execute it, what materials you are going to use, what kind of print, is it a letterpress or is it a lithography, etching, whatever, whatever. Then you need to try to find some uh, fina financial support because it's, it's, it's not a cheap approach. And then you begin, and it's also, it's no rush. You are both for yourself, therefore nobody push you. But if you're in a process, you are spending day and night on this project. You know, this is not how to say, this is what you are going to do for life. For... Therefore, it's a depends. Sometimes, I repeat, one project, I suppose, took me something more than four years, but not this one. And also letterpress. And uh, 
a lot of book I printed in a, this is representative for the company, which I admire. My best friend, Peter Kruti, in the Peter Kruti edition in Brooklyn. He is a, this is a family, it's absolutely, my interview, uh, Sarah, they're working together and I'm very gratitude the, that I have opportunity to work with this family in Brooklyn and that it's a letter press. You can imagine it's the set type like Jorgen Gutenberg did it character by character. It's a relief printing. They don't, they also, they had this machine, you know, when they use a real leg, but also their letter press, it's a, it's a proof press. Even we're working on that place. It's like a theater. I got a lot of inspiration just coming to that place. Yeah. You should mention also the sourcing of material, which is very difficult, very costly, and uh, sometimes very complicated, and also it can be very comical. So when Mikhail was working on a version of the Nightingale, the Anderson story, so uh, his concept was to do uh, a nightingale that really would be somehow Chinese in character. And he wanted a very special paper. So Mikhail is on the phone. He speaks a very fine English, but not free of any accent. And he's trying to convince a Chinese company to send him a handful of sheets of Actually, paper. it was a Japanese one. Oh, Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me it was Chinese. But anyway, Chinese is the most cheap, I know, Japanese. Japanese. But these people who are used to immense industrial orders so to get them to send a few a few sheets of paper is really quite a feat and that that happens uh, all the time and the other thing that he does what is really brilliant about his business model is that he makes so few books that he's usually lucky it's for five books if, if, yeah. if, if, if he's lucky if he can recover the cost of the, <laughs> of the books you know because it's it's just a Anyway, so it's a labor of love, but you know, he's created a body of work. Uh, there, there are a large group of books in Princeton, for example. There are, there are books in Yale, there are books in the Library of Congress. There are some, a book or two books in, in the Metropolitan. And, and this is something that will, will last, that will be here for a long time. And now the uh, Library of the Human Imagination. Yes. It's the Library of Human Imagination. It, yes. This last weekend, I was purchasing a one of your books. Can you tell us what book that is and a little bit more about it? <clears throat> this is a more contemporary and harsh topic. The book calls Bukvar Nash, our ADC book. You know, during the occupation of Crimea, Russian patriots repeated the same slogan. Crimea is ours, Crimea is ours. And like a satirical response of that, I made a book, ABC book is ours. This is a book like hard joke on a Putin supporters. Partly it's a bit, okay, what we did. I worked, I worked on this book with my friend and um, Russian photographer, who lived in Moscow now, Ivan Lebedev. Mm -hmm. And we find some unusual, actually it's usual, it's a very common citizen. And we gave some in them something like a tank uniform, something like that, and make a photo of them. And then in alphabet order, we illustrated different, uh, Themes using these Im images, and also some, because it's a very rough people, uneducated people. We they turned some people. It's a big, uh, greasy spots on the pages. Uh, it's a very unusual book and shocked book. It's not like a fine art. It's a how to how to how to watch the strong word for that. It's it's very rough, rough. very uh, edgy book. Um, it's um, it also it's, it's part of a genre which traditionally is quite different. So 
in the genre of ABC books, this really stands out. And it also implies that there's something very basic inherent in Russia and the Russians. You know, this, this is the alphabet. This is the stuff of which they are made. And uh, it was a book, I guess, made partially in anger or as a response to what was uh, one of the first uh, violations of the, the yeah. world order since the Second World War, which is which gone, which went almost unnoticed, and certainly there was no response to it. Okay, this is about that book. It, it was very um, limited edition, just three books. It's you know, it sometimes. The artists have a very strange feeling with the old books gone. You know, this was the last book. <laughs> you know, I sold this book, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you're giving your chance to, to it's, it's a mixed feeling. Yeah. But anyway, I'm happy. Master, I'm happy. I'm still happy. <laughs> oh, uh, th this. This will be another book. Okay, I can get the proof again. Yes, I don't. I don't. But we're missing. Okay. You, you can you can present this book. I will add something. This is a book named Lenin Hunting, but it's based on a Russian counting rhyme. Counting rhyme. Раз два три четыре пять вышел зайчик погулять. Okay. This is the box. It's a young linen. You know that. Yes. yes like yes. a uh, young uh, pioneer sign. Yes. Yes. Before okay. they give it even in kindergarten. Okay. Oh. Okay. I know you. you Lose it. I repeat it. No this, but anyway, artist statement: the counting rhyme, a traditional Russian "ini, mini, miny, mo" still in use, concerns a rabbit spotted by a hunter, shot dead. He is miraculously resurrected when he is returned home. In the artist version, the hunter is Lenin, and he is transformed into Stalin at the end of the rhyme. In fact. The rabbit's immortality is conferred on Lenin, the hunter, and his successor. So, <laughs> this is, of course, an allusion to mausoleums that conserve the remains of the immortals. And also, like most of Magaril's work, is a reflection of the pervasive contamination of every aspect of popular culture of childhood by communist iconography. <laughs> so, then, this is the book that we decided spoke most clearly to the paintings because yes um, this, this is, is the right each line represented one spread ah okay so it's one two three four five money stepped out for a stride suddenly a hunter's there shoots the poor defenseless hare poof poof oh my oh my little bunny's going to die they bring him home and they have found it's alive, safe, and sound. And I need to mention something. I'm very gratitude that my daughter translated this. This is her <laughs> translation. Yes. This is uh, now I realize I'm really paying money for her good education <laughs> <laughs> for a good reason. <laughs> Okay, this is a book. But by the way, this is all stencil printing. Well, I'm not sure that this position is the best one. Okay, because I can destroy the book. Oh, it's still from the show. I have a. I'm not sure. Okay, this is copy number one. It's still available, by the way. <laughs> Lenin hunting. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I don't know why, but it's all good, like a KGB. I don't know. It's... <laughs> But my, by the way, my invention, you know, Lenin never smoked, but in my art, he's smoking every time. <laughs> he's smoking. No, not my computer. This is a lie. You can do it in your uh, This is wrong. This is this one. Okay, you can write this, this line. Little bunny's going to die. <laughs> and then they bring him home and they have found. You know, this is a mausoleum. It's a lie. Safe and sound. <laughs> so it's a finish. Buster. <laughs> and this is a silhouette Lenin and Stalin. I know. They're like a two dots. And this is another end paper. Okay, that's it for this book. Okay, this is briefly what we were going to show you. Any questions? Uh, Michel, I am just uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, your sense of humor and whatever. What about the contemporary, uh, the company ID about the Russian uh, ship? You know, it's a lot of people already, you know, work with this one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I suppose successfully from the beginning, from the action to the art. But you know, they they published the stem for two thousand dollars for one stem. <laughs> I mean, there is a premonitory quality to this because these things, which are a reflection on his childhood and the material culture of his childhood, kind of predict the, the, the style of propaganda and disinformation that is still going on. So if you understand this and you see through that propaganda, you can see through what is being said now. Um, it's it's the same mechanism. Yes, yeah, sorry for interrupting you. But you know, during this time, my mother told me, even a best friend sometimes told, you know, it's not possible the smoke without fire. Something happened. Maybe you don't know, but they was going to poison the government. Unfortunately, the same now. You can imagine the percent of uh, people who support this invasion and support the war. It's scary. Even I remember these guys, they were decent guy from the good family. This is how propaganda works. They work perfectly in Russia. I don't know about uh, you know economics, politics, but propaganda worked great in that, unfortunately in that country. Yeah. But we will not finish on this set. <laughs> no, <you> know, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. something it's more fine, cheerful. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you read the lullaby? The lullaby. The lullaby. No, the, the, in, in oh, the lullaby. Okay, you know, you can read in English. Yeah. Okay, I will be read. No, I will read in Russian, and you will read in English. Okay? okay. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is a rare book. Do you know why? Absolutely unique. In this book, I published my mother-in-law, the photo. She's here. 
<laughs> now and i don't so i don't think in a um, history of book publishing you can find something like this and this is my wife i show you okay Okay, I will be written. Пали тени, птички смолты, спиди тебя родное, не страшись ночного мрака. Я ведь здесь с тобою. The shadows are gone, the birds are silent. Sleep, my son, my little one. Don't be afraid of the dark shadows. Am I not with you? By the way, this is our my communal kitchen you know the communal apartment where the several families live together okay на рассвете защебечет пташки звончик краши глянет утро и с востока встанет солнце наше the east will light up the wings of song will chirp and sing dawn will grow pale and from the east our sun will also rise Okay, this is a terrible yes. clip. Okay. Ты еврей, печаль и горе, жизнь и счастье в этом, отпрыск древнего народа, гордого предцветом. Ты ребенок, станешь старше, ясно сердцу станет, что творил он, что создаст он, сейчас как солнце встанет. You are a Hebrew, my son, but this is your joy and your misfortune. You are a branch of an ancient people. Your strength is above other nations. You are still a lad. When you grow up, you will know the great deeds of your people. Then you will understand what is hidden when our sun will rise. This Lenin statue, the dated yes, Lenin statue. Yes, yes. Okay. Станешь мужем, жизнь this is lullaby, still remember, please. Станешь мужем, жизнь придушит злобную рукою. А пока усни спокойно, я всегда с тобою. День угас, усни мой птенчик. Ночь глядит в оконце. Не страшись ночного мрака, встанет наше солнце. You will become a man. The hand of evil people will go after you, my little one. Until then sleep and be at rest, for I am with you. Darkness covers us. Don't be frightened of the dark shadows. Our sun will also rise. Oh, by the way, this is my family photo. When we decided to immigrate, it, we made this photo with a stamp. Stamp is a permission for leave Soviet Union, but not as a people, like a commodity. Yeah. yeah. Permission to export. For, to export. By the way, this is my daughter and son, daughter and son, and then, okay. Будешь ты с китайцем в мире, только об отчизне, о святом Сионе помни, до заката жизни. Если светлый день спасения даже медлит станет, не теряй мой сын надежды, снова солнце встанет. You will be a wanderer in the world, but you have only one homeland. This do not forget, your banner is Zion, until you are lowered into the grave. Even if the redemption tarries and marches slowly, don't despair or give up hope. Our sun will rise. Oh, this is with this is, connection with this rag. That's the textile, as you can see. Textile, yes. Okay. Padalini и Ardana. Бродят бедуины. Ты же будешь первым стражем нашей Палестины. И когда взовьются стяги, сын мой не обманет. Он пойдет с мечом меж храбрых, наше солнце встанет. On the Jordan and in Sharon there dwell Arabs. This land will be ours and you will be among the builders. And when one day those that carry the banner will raise it high, don't separate yourself from them. Raise your weapon with the brave ones, for our sun will have risen. Okay, 
and this you can read an explanation yeah, for I'm each. I'm tired of me reading. Yeah, this okay. Is more or less, like what we said before. Okay. Yeah, note, much in the lullaby resonates with the personal history of my family, a feeling of constant anxiety and instability. Anti Semitism, both state sponsored and from individuals, were all part of our daily life. The word Jew could not be uttered out loud. It was something indecent, like syphilis. All the photos in the book were taken at different times in Leningrad. One picture shows a communal kitchen with a row of gas stoves. Each tenant had his stove jammed into the same kitchen. Next comes a picture of the apartment house with death to the kikes daubed on the wall. Afterwards, a photo from the end days of Soviet power, a vandalized statue of Lenin planted on a dilapidated pedestal. Following that, a snapshot of my family's successful application to leave for Israel permanently. The custom stamp reads, permitted for export from the USSR, as if it is not people leaving the country, but things. Finally, a photo with its own special story. When I was small, a woven rug hung above my bed with images of palm trees, Bedouin, and a market crowded with people on donkeys. I was so sure that this was what our Palestine looked like, the promised land, that I brought this rug to America and hoped to pass it on to my future grandson, which led to a great problem because then there was another grandchild. So then... But I prepared to quote eh? then, copies. Then are, copy yes, I did. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is end paper. It's hand made. It, it's it's a drawing directly on a book. I, I want to show this one. This one the first, and the last one. Okay, I suppose this is. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thank you.